So to begin our discussion of symbolic interactionist theory, and in particular the theories of George Herbert Mead, I usually ask my students to get out their cell phones and take a selfie. So if you want to do that, you can pause the video for this activity and go ahead and use your cell phone to take a selfie. It looks something like this, right? So then I ask students to basically put in a sentence what they just did. And so students will usually say, I took a picture of myself or I took a picture of me. So then you can think about that with regard to what George Herbert Mead says about the I, me, and generalized other. So George Herbert Mead separates these parts of ourselves. So starting with the I and the me. So it's very similar to psychological theories, right? So there's an I part of ourself and there's a me. The I is the acting part of yourself. That's the part of you that took the picture. It's all action, right? The I is fleeting. You can never be certain how the I will act. As George Herbert Mead says, the I is something that is never entirely calculable. So for example, you can prepare for an interview and figure out everything that you're going to say, rehearse it, but then you get to that interview and everything that you thought you were going to say and how you imagined in your mind that it was going to go, the I messes it up in the moment, right? The I is never truly calculable. So the I is the part of you that took the picture, the acting part of yourself. So then what is the me? The me is the person you see in your phone. That's the picture of you. Or if you're looking in the mirror, the reflection of you is the me. Look at your selfie. Just like in this slide, you're probably posing in that picture. When I do this in class, my students take a while to take a picture. They'll be fixing their hair, right? They'll take more than one picture. You're posing. And when, you're, when you pose, you're presenting a certain self. That, you, that others will see. You're aware of the me. The me is the thinking part of the self. So in that preparation for the imaginary interview that you're, you're going to, all of the thought process and you're preparing and rehearsing is done in the me. And the I is the action. What if I asked you to hand your phone to the person next to you if you were in class? Usually when I ask my students to, to hand their phone to the other person and let them look at all their pictures, there's a lot of hesitation. Sometimes there's fear because they think that I'm actually going to make them give their phone to the person next to them and let them look at all their picture. I ask them, would they do it? And then most of my students are, will say no. They're not going to hand their phone over to their neighbor, to some stranger, and let them look at the pictures. And so what, do, what are you thinking about? What's your thought process? You're probably thinking about what kind of pictures you have on your phone, worried about what somebody else might think of you if they see certain pictures. You might want to delete some pictures before you let people look at what's on your phone. What you're doing is taking on the generalized other. And that's also what you would do if you were deciding whether or not you're going to post your selfie to Instagram or Facebook. You would think about what others think of your picture. You would see yourself from their perspective and anticipate their response. So then maybe you'll want to take a different picture. So you're taking on a generalized other, an audience, or and there are multiple generalized others. So let's take a look at when these different parts of the self develop. So Mead says that the I, the acting part of the self, develops in what he calls the pre-play stage. Infants know only the I. They're not concerned about whether, they're, whether or not they're drooling, what, other, what are the other babies going to think of me, they haven't developed a me fully yet, or the ability to take on a generalized other. They develop that through interacting with each other. As they interact with others, they develop a me. So the me becomes fully developed in the, police, the, the play stage. The me, again, is the thinking part of the self, the part that has been socialized. Children who are developing their me learn about rules. So they do rule taking. They play at different rules. They'll play being mommy or daddy or play at being a doctor. 
but they haven't yet learned to understand how other people feel. So this is why young toddlers have such a hard time understanding the viewpoint of their parents. They haven't developed that ability to put themselves in other people's shoes. So I used to characterize one of my daughters, well, both of my daughters were kind of like this. I would characterize their play as playing at me. So Justice, my older daughter, had this way of saying, sit here, mommy, I'm going to play, I'm going to be a mail carrier and I'm going to be bringing you all kinds of mail. It was part of some game. But she'd be playing around and about me and walking all, all over through the house and she'd essentially forget about me and I'm sitting here bored knowing that I have all kinds of work to do. And the minute I get out my computer, that's when she says, mommy, what are you doing? You're supposed to be playing at me or you're supposed to be playing with me. Or if I move, then she notices. But I'm sitting here and she's supposed to be bringing me mail and she never brings me mail. So this is sort of like playing at a lot of parents or people who have a lot of experience with children. They they understand this characterization of somebody playing at you. They have They don't understand putting themselves in in your shoes, but they take on these different rules and expect you to be there, to wait for them. So this is why Mead states, the child is one thing at one time and another at another. And what he is at one moment does not determine what he will do at any moment. That is both the charm of childhood as well as its inadequacy. So when children play kickball or baseball or soccer at this stage, that you see them getting distracted easily. They might start playing in the dirt. They might sit down. You know, they're not really focused. They're, they're all focused on the ball. They're not understanding that there are different positions within this game that need to be uh, taken account of. That develops in the game stage. So here we see children being able to understand how to take on complex rules. So the game of chess is a good example of the generalized other. At this stage, children are developing the ability to anticipate other people's actions, anticipate other people's emotions, and then change what they're going to do based on what they anticipate. And so in baseball, for example, being able to steal a base, you can't do that unless you've developed a generalized other because you sort of have to predict what everybody around you, what they're going to do before you make your decision. And so this is a crucial point in our development because it is here that we learn what is expected of us from larger groups, and it's where we develop empathy. So you can think about that in terms of what we've already discussed in this class with regard to gender, right? How and when do we develop our ideas about gender and what is expected of us? How is our... How are our I, me, and generalized other affected by these gendered ideas? And so for more of this, I would recommend looking at Jean Kilborn's Killing Us Softly.